So, everyone, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Everything is seems okay. Okay, great, great. You can see my slides and and and, and the drawing and everything. Yeah. Right? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Then again, welcome back. Uh, third time's the charm, right? So. Now it's the hands-on part, right? So we actually to get some some code and and and, and implementations and and things like that. So we have had earlier today these these lectures, and 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 now we're going into this one. So just briefly, right? So today in the morning we had causal for machine learning one, uh, where we explored basic concepts. Um, then we had the second lecture where we really talked about you know uh, ongoing work and and some selected publications. And now we are doing the hands-on session to to really see some of the concepts we have explored in 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 any of these lectures, um, but also some 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 other stuff, right? So so really just diving in uh, to the extent that we can in a, in a session like this. Um, again, we have this time slot reserved for us, so approximately ninety minutes, and and now we're just going to using these slides shortly discuss the whole setup and and then. You know, the idea is really to make this this interactive, or at least in the sense that, you know, everyone can try it out. So um, there is this uh, public repository. Uh, you should be able to find it. It's for uh, this year's uh, um, uh, data science school. And um, there is for day four, which is the day today, the causality for machine learning um, subdirectory, and it contains this tutorial directory. And there you will actually find the notebook. So um, what you should do next is uh, just download this repo, right? Go to this repo, download this repo, um, and then open this file using the Google Colab. So I'll be doing that in a second as well, but already just pointing out how, how this should work. Um, you can go to Colab by simply going to this link, colab.research.google.com, um, and then you can actually select here GitHub, and, and actually just paste uh, the link. So maybe if someone wants to already share this link, would be great. Um, and then you can just simply click here. Uh, Colab is great because you don't have to set up anything else uh, and it's running over Google service. Um, yeah, so how will it look like? So so that's what you should see then when, when you successfully open this in, in Colab. Um, it's our hands-on for causality for machine learning. Uh, it's consisting of five exercises, which you can see here below. Um, each of them has an approximate time. I'll keep an eye on that, and and we'll just you know always announce those and and then go through them um, um, after some time. But yeah, that's that's how how this looks like. And uh, one more important thing. So uh, in the beginning of the lab, uh, Colab, we we're, we're gonna you know um, get all the dependencies right and and, and things like that. And, and and so in this utility functions tab, um, it actually depends on, on you uploading these things from the, from the repo, right? So it's just these three files. Uh, you can just push this button here, upload them, and then you should not see any of these errors. They should be done all, all good. So. Okay. Then, yeah. The hands-on algorithm. So, so what's the algorithm to doing this? So, first step, setting up the collab. Then the second step, we check for the next exercise. If there is one, then you know we'll just just announce it. Then you start exploring for yourself. Finally, we look at the solution at least together, right? To just do that too as well. And then we go back. And then if there's no exercises, we are done, and we have hopefully learned a lot, right? So that's that's the setup here. Um, and yeah. Without further ado, I'd say we we go now coding. Yeah, so I'll just uh, switch the setup here and share my reshare my screen to the browser. So so I'll just also great. We also have amazing. I see the link is already shared, and now I'll just switch to a browser. So I hope you can see my browser screen now of the Google Chrome. Did you just confirm? Is it fine? Yeah, we see. Yeah. Oh, OK, great. OK, so we'll just do the same setup here. So we go to Google Colab.
uh, now we use the link uh, from the repository, which you find in the chat. Set, make sure to say GitHub, press enter, should find it. There it is. And now the call app is opening. So, so this should, all of this should work for everyone. Uh, if there's any issues or so, just put them in the comment and I mean, we'll try to help. And um, yeah, so now just some of these local files. I have to confirm that I'm not a robot. I'll just do this now. Bridges, that's also machine learning. So now here we select the upload button and simply upload the files from the um, GitHub repository, which in this case are these three files uh, called linear.py, utils.py, and, and, the, and the dataset file. So now you can see I've uploaded these files. I can again close this one and we can start. So uh, just as a, as a first uh, heads up, this tutorial is combining uh, elements from two previous tutorials, uh, which have been done in the scope of, 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 of research schools um, and tutorials. So um, one of them is actually first authored by Alex uh, with contributions by, by his students. So uh, also check out their stuff. They're doing very cool work. Um, really, you know, abstract for this tutorial, I mean, there's several things which we're looking at, um, but it's mostly things we have seen or different guises of things we have seen and, and really just covering it all from the get go. So it's not like you, you necessarily need to have now listened actually to the lectures before. Of course, if you have, then, then all of these things will go a lot faster and, and be familiar to you. So again, we have five exercises. I'll be stopping the time after each announcement to give a little bit of time to explore for yourself. And then uh, after that time's up, we'll go over the solution and, and continue until we're finished. Um, yeah, before you start, I mean, usually, you know, when you go here to the runtime, then GPU should be by default. It's not really necessary. Um, it's just when we train a model later, obviously it goes faster. Um, yeah, and then, you know, notes about the math, just, just some details here. Okay, so I'll just show you just simply click here. In this case, I have to say run anyway. And then we should see that this should correctly render. So it's just setting up some of these dependencies which we're going to use. Nothing much special. There's just some, for example, this you know causal learn uh, package. It's like the do why package I was showing you earlier, uh, which you know implements some of these causal discovery methods. Um, but then there's also just you know, standard uh, stuff like, for example, NumPy, Pandas, uh, plotting uh, uh, possibilities and so on. And then this one as well. And, and this one is, is containing just some, some again, visualization things. Um, the only data related thing is this generate data X, X4B, which is for the fourth exercise, which is um, going to give us some images from the, from the Cypher 10 image data set. And yeah, so now this is set up and I'll just uh, put on a timer. We'll give this one 15 minutes. So in exercise one, it's called Simpsons Paradox. Uh, we didn't actually talk about Simpson Paradox, but I mean, it's, it's, it's strongly related to all these things that we have seen so far, and also to the biology example we had in, in causality for machine learning one. Um, and it, it has to do with, with curiosity, with, with confounders. Um, and so, we are going to now dive deep into this one. And here's the context, right? So, oops, I don't know. So, here's the context. So, the world is confronted with a rare disease, say it's COVID or whatever, right? And, and for, you know, the world's public health agencies, they are trying to get a therapist, the, you know, someone who can, you know, like provide therapeutics for it, uh, be it vaccine, be it medication or whatever. Um, and now, you know, scientists have recently proposed a new drug and the effectiveness has not yet fully been demonstrated. And so you are actually the government's top data scientists, right? And so you are now tasked actually with finding evidence for the fact whether or not the drug is actually effective, right? And since this, of course, is not like light task, um, you know, you, you have to take it seriously since, you know, the, 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 the feedback you give will actually have uh, yeah, effect on your country, on, on your country's treatment policy. Um, and since there's not enough time to run a clinical study, uh, you, you collect the data in the neighboring country, um, and this is what you're going to use as your base. Yeah? And, and these are the variables we define. 
uh, we have the C, uh, the severity of a symptom, classified into either mild, strong, or critical, so it's categorical, treatment that was administered, and survival after one month. And simple as that, good luck. Um, yeah, you can simply go through these ones, one by one, and you will always find these, these question blocks um, where you are asked, and, and you can then evaluate for yourself and, and click on the answer. And um, yeah, without further ado, um, we'll give it approximately 10 minutes, and then we'll go over the solution together, giving you enough time to explore this for yourself.
Okay, so now we are going to go over together our exercise one. I, I hope uh, uh, for everyone who wanted to try it out themselves, they were able to. So the first step here, very simple. We are just loading up a data set and printing up a couple of rows just to validate that everything looks fine. But as you can see, there's Z, A and Y, um, and they are also in the regions, ranges, uh, the domains and the ranges. As, as suggested. Okay, so we are interested in measuring the average treatment effect, right? And the average treatment effect is estimated, well, we could estimate it by this quantity, right? Like we could say, okay, what is the expectation of Y for all the ones where we observe A equals one, which means, you know, treatment was administered and uh, against those where it wasn't. So here we go and we plot. Uh, we observe the following. And if you look at the answer, uh, it seems like the treatment has a detrimental effect on survival, which is that suggests that it's not effective. Yeah? And this is really odd, uh, since we were told that the treatment is absolutely state of the art. So let's look a little bit further, right? So we do the following plot. And well, that's actually quite interesting. So, so what do we observe? So we plot the symptoms against uh, the, the probability of, of getting the drug, given the symptoms, or the propensity. And we see that the probability of being treated clearly increases with the strength of the symptoms, right? And that's probably due to the policy, right? So we look a little further and, and, and following where we now plot uh, again the symptoms, but this time against y equals one, right? Like whether, you know, the person survived or not. And what do we observe? Well, it clearly decreases, right? Like the, the, the stronger the symptoms as expected, uh, the, the lesser the chances of survival. So let's take a graphical perspective. Um, and, and what we essentially see is uh, uh, that we kind of observe this structure here. Yeah? And therefore we say, okay, there's a confounder Z and, and A is affecting Y. So the uh, treatment affects the recovery and both are being affected by the severity of the symptom. Um, and, and actually what this means is that um, you know, that this can only be due to these parts, which then again means um, to get, you know, the answer, we need to isolate A and Y, right? Like, because this thing is actually considering the confounder, um, but we need to isolate it. We just want to have this below arrow, not any information flowing across uh, this fog. Yeah? And only this will reveal the true effect. And so how can we do this? Well, one of the tricks one can do is randomization. You, you flip a coin, right? And, and you assign people equally or, or randomly actually to, to, to some treatment, right? Whether they like or not. And we discussed early in the lectures that this is not always the best idea um, when it comes to ethical concerns or, 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 or say simple costs in terms of financial services, then, um, but here we can do it, right? Like here we can do it. <laughs> we are in this powerful setting. At least we are telling those to the scientists. So we regenerate the data set where we randomize this time. Um, and so actually here, you have to do a change, right? So we'll just do it now. So you want to have it random, right? Before that, it would have not been random. So let's rerun. So this is our new generate data set. Looks okay, but now let's plot and, and look indeed. And so now we see indeed, independent of um, the, the symptom, our propensity is being chosen, right? So, so this is what we needed. Uh, so the randomization actually transform this equation into this one, which is the actual average treatment effect, as you can recognize by what we've seen in causality for machine learning one, the dual operator. Um, and yeah, and, and next, now we just do the same again, and, and we look at uh, the effect and, and voila, we see it's a totally different view, right? So if we now compare it, we can see that the actual causal effect of the treatment is positive and, and, and a lot more strong in absolute terms than what we estimate with the conditional. Suggesting that, well, there was indeed confounding bias, right? So um, Simpson's paradox, essentially, right? That essentially we look at the treatment overall and it, it looks like it's, it's having a bad effect, but then you look at each of the separate groups themselves and you conclude it's actually working better. Um, and yeah, so so that's the difference really between condition and acting with, or, or intervening which is crucial to causality. So the next exercise, exercise two, will be about parent adjustment, which means that we are gonna do the same as above, 
but a little bit differently. We are not doing the randomization. And so again, we are setting a timer here. Um, and um, yeah, enjoy this one.
So, welcome back everyone. Let's discuss the solutions to exercise two parent adjustment. So, from the previous section, what we saw or what we concluded was that the causal graph uh, underlying our problem looks a little like this, right? Where, where the treatment has a direct effect on, on, on whether we recover or not, and the conditions affect both of them. And so, in terms of probability theory, we can just write it like this factorization below, which, you know, given what we saw in, in Cosentic Machine Learning 1, global Markov property and faithfulness leads to this factorization. So, uh, to now reason about interventions, uh, what we did was essentially we randomized, right? And, and so, in a sense, we forced people to take treatment and to not take it. And what you can imagine this to do is, well, you, you hammer in the, the prescription, right? And, and so, the, the connection to Z gets lost, right? And so now to do what is called identification, right? To, to actually get this, this uh, expectation of interest um, with only observational data, which is confounded, we, we have to be, be a bit clever, right? And what can we do? I mean, we saw that the causal hierarchy theorem tells you that you cannot do anything without further assumption, but we have assumptions, right? Like we have this causal graph. And so we are using that one uh, to do what's called parent adjustment, right? So, so we are going to adjust for the the, the parents of of um, of the treatment, uh, in this case A, right? So uh, which will be Z, the parent. Um, and yeah, so so we have this derivation here. So uh, you see that when you do an intervention, you simply get this this delta, which just asserts, okay, this is indeed consistent. It's just one in the case where it's an indicator function. When, when the value of A is indeed what it should be. Um, and yeah, then we can start deriving this. So, so you can always write this um, as, as this more general form with the sums, right? So, so you marginalized out, we just go the reverse direction. Then we use the above definition to, to get the delta in. Um, then for all of the A's which don't match the intervention, of course, it'll be zero. For everything else, it'll be one. And then if you clean up a bit, you end up with this which does not contain any do anymore, which tells you that it's an L1, right? A layer one, uh, uh, an association level query. So you have successfully identified now the causal estimate. And you remember also from causality for machine learning one, we had the talk about the do calculus and, and, and how it's complete set of rules allows us to get the estimates. Well, we didn't do uh, um, do calculus here, but we did parent adjustment, right? Which is uh, one of the predecessors to, to the do calculus. Um, and yeah, now to get the average treatment effect, right? So, so we know it's it's this quantity and um, we can simply take the average over these interventional distributions. Um, in this case, since we look at these, this binary setting, it's just because we either recover or we don't, it's, it's just simply that. And then by replacing the do with its parent adjustment, we end up with this one. And really that's all what's happening here, which is also implemented. So we can run it and voila, we look at the average treatment effect scores. Uh, we see the conditional thing was wrong, right? The randomization was kind of the gold standard. And you see that the parent adjustment worked just fine, right? Um, and, and of course the, the thing with, for example, the that it's like not perfectly matching or anything, that's really just because of the samples, right? Um, but yeah, in the limits, they are the same. So here uh, is just a, a bonus in a sense. So, so we could also have done this with a more fancy estimator. So, so we could have done, you know, like a Monte Carlo kind of simulation approach where we just sample a lot of uh, these different uh, XI. Yeah? Um, and then what we do here essentially is just, again, we have the same setup as before. And then since it's a binary variable, you can write it in terms of the expectation. Um, and then this expectation is really right. I, I mean, this this is just the definition of the expectation here over Z in this case. And now this you can approximate in with Monte Carlo, right? Like you simply take a regressor for all of these different uh, Z samples. And so if we do that and, and run that one, and what we see is we get the identical results, of course, with the fancy estimator, which is close to the truth. Uh, and definitely, yeah, it's 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 in any case the correct one. Yeah, so that was exercise two, and now we are going to an exercise three, uh, 
do again the same thing, right, as we did essentially with the randomization and the parent adjustment, but now again from a different perspective. And this time we go from parent to backdoor adjustment. Um, and therefore we also look at a little bit of a different graph because in, in, in the upper case, parent adjustment, backdoor adjustment would have been the same. Uh, here it is not, so, so we'll con consider that one. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll start the timer again and uh, have fun.
Hello everyone, welcome back. We're now going to discuss the solutions to exercise number three from parent to backdoor adjustment. So what do we start with? So first, according to this graph, we are going to look at a couple of different graphs and according to this graph, we generate some data. So let's do this here. Yeah, it looks like this. And what do we observe? Well, we observe that it uh, uh, corresponds to our intuition, Yeah, that we can really read off from the graph that uh, C blocks all the paths from A to B. So, you know, conditional on C doesn't change our belief in, 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 in B when we add A. So now the next graph. So we go from the um, chain, uh, from the Fox structure to a chain structure. Again, same game. We generate uh, these, these distributions for, for A, um, for, for B given A, um, and when C is zero. And what we can see is that B depends uh, on A if we don't condition on C, but it doesn't when we condition. Um, and then finally, we do the collider. So where we have this V structure that we discussed in, in the first lecture. And now here it looks a bit different, right? So, so we see that um, they, uh, they are independent uh, un unless we condition on C, right? So when we see C, then suddenly information can flow between them, right? And, and that is what's shown here. And this might strike you as odd because it's kind of contrary to the, to the previous thing, but it's really just the concept of deseparation that we just discussed briefly. So imagine an example, for example, here, A, B, C being chosen like this. So A is an athlete, B is the difficulty of, of, of a test, and, and, and C is the score on that one. And, and so when you know that someone had a great score, um, then suddenly, you know, being an athlete and the difficulty of the test start to compete, right? But if you don't know about the score, then these things are uh, independent. And now we put our thing in, in test, right, to, to, to practice. So we are going to assume a slightly more complicated structure. It has these two uh, Z nodes of, out of which one is not observed, right? So let's generate the graph according to this. That is done. And now let's just check the dependency, you know, between A and, and, and these latent uh, nodes. And what we can see is the following. That um, the distribution from A clearly changes, right? Like uh, with, with Z1 and Z2. Um, so there's a, certainly a dependency between those, right? Like, I mean, we see all of them being different. There's no uh, equal uh, probabilities here. So now we can also check the same thing for uh, the association with, with Y. And uh, again, we see that the distribution of Y changes uh, with Z1 and Z2. So there is a dependency. Uh, even when we block the path, right? Like even when we observe A and, and, and block the path AY. Um, and this tells us really that they are confounders. Um, and now, in the next step, what we are going to look at is the following. So we see that you know if we condition on 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 all of these things, then suddenly we we block all the paths, right? So so then uh, suddenly um, we 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 get this uh, independence. And and that is what's also suggested here. So we have looked at different graphs. Uh, we have checked these, you know, these the, the according data sets and, and, and the dependencies. And now we want to do again treatment effect like previously, but now with a little bit of a different trick. So uh, what we do now here first is, you see, we have this, this causal effect of, of A and Y. Um, we can always extend it again, right? So marginalization. Um, then we use our derivation with parent adjustment from exercise uh, from the previous exercise. Um, then we can actually factorize this. So, so you can always, because we know the structure, right, with a Z1 and Z2. Um, and then given that we know that there's an independence between Z1 and, 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 and Y, when we condition on A and Z2, we can rewrite it like this. Uh, finally, um, since, you know, uh, it, it is constant when you sum, sum over Z1, you can uh, restructure it the following way. And, and obviously, since summing over uh, what comes in front uh, will, will result in one because that's all the events that are possible under that condition, uh, we are simply left with this one. 
And that's super cool, actually. So, so this is, again, the parent adjustment we used here. But what we see is that we don't even need to adjust for Z1. So we had a slightly more complicated example here, but it works, right? And, and well, what is the general pattern here? Um, well, it's this backdoor criterion, right? So, so Perl 2009, that's the book we were talking about um, and which we reference a lot during the first lecture. Um, and with that, we can actually identify, right? So, so you don't necessarily need to do calculus. Right? So, and, and this is what we're doing here. So we are just setting up the uh, estimator and then we are running the following again as before for the ATEs. And here we have the bigger list. Uh, the numbers are a little bit different. Why? Well, we, we look at different graph now here and different data, of course. Um, and what you can see is really that um, when you, you know, try to do the backdoor with, with C1 or simple conditionals, you get the wrong estimate. This time around, it's not uh, so so drastic in a sense that, you know, it's still the same positive sign, but you can tell that it's overestimating the, the actual causal effect, which is around 0.23. Cool. With this, we have done, you know, parent adjustment, backdoor adjustment, looked at deseparation, in general, the phenomenon of a paradox, uh, and now it's going to get a little bit more spicy. So in the next exercise, we are actually going to use machine learning. I mean, you can argue, right, with the Monte Carlo and everything, these are standard machine learning practice. Um, but now we are actually going to look at more complex high dimensional data. Best example are images, right, where the uh, pixels usually uh, denote this, this, this list of dimensions. And, uh, and, and since there are a lot of pixels and even small images, that's already high dimensional data and it's complex since uh, it's not clear how these pixels are related on a pixel level. And so, again, uh, have a lot of fun with this one. Um, I hope you're able to download the data set. It's the Cypher 10. If it shows an error, like something like uh, 500 internal server error, uh, just wait a little and try again. Uh, that can happen, but that's not on our side. Um, and yeah, I'll put a time again and enjoy.
OK, welcome back, everyone. So now we are going to discuss the solutions to our machine learning task, the estimation via machine learning. So um, we had this graph structure as previously in, in, in the first exercise. Um, and, and what we will start now is so, so the confounder is going to be in this case, the, the high level thing, right? The, the, the images in this cat case of, of uh, you know, Cypher 10 containing dogs and cats. So let's just load that up and hope this runs through. And now it's downloading and extracting. And after that, it should be plotting some examples. And as we can clearly see, so these are natural images of uh, of dogs and, 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 and cats and in general animals, um, our four leg companions. Um, and now in the next step, what we're going to do is prepare the data set just for use with PyTorch. So run that. And now here in the following, we just have a simple convolution neural network. Uh, a CNN is always suited well for, for images. Um, and, and that's what we're setting up here with this net class. And now in the next step, we are going to evaluate this. We're going to train this and evaluate this at each time and, and see that our loss goes down ideally. And we're going to train for 10 epochs across uh, our data set. So it should be printing something like this. And we can see what is being plotted is, is the loss in each epoch and, and the accuracy. Uh, for training and validation, obviously never optimize on the test set, but that's just classic machine learning. <laughs> and um, yeah, as we can see, we already decreased our loss from 0.69 to, to, to 60 approximately. Uh, validation also went down, so that's great. So we have trade now. Now we just need a function which kind of gives us these propensity scores, these uh, you know estimates based on the neural network. So we run this one. And now we can just look at the propensity score. So, so the probability of giving a treatment based on the high level information you know, and, and see what it looks like. So here we're going to do automatic density plots for these individuals. And it might look a little like this. So what we are seeing is the different densities as estimated by our density estimator for the probability of, of uh, you know, treatment being assigned and then being assigned when you know that it's a cat and it's a dog. And you can clearly see these two modes um, which seem to correspond uh, to confounding. Um, and now to put our knowledge to the test, we can run our neural network to predict the average treatment effect in this special setting where we have this uh, confounding with high high dimensional data, in this case, uh, these pixels. And what we see is the following. So the conditional in this case, again, it has a negative sign, while the actual true right randomization would give you 0.17. And our trained model is not perfect, Right, but we didn't do any special hyperparameter tuning now. And then again, we are estimating based on high dimensional data. And here we can clearly see we are we are on the right track. And so that concludes the machine learning part um, for cause effect estimation. But in causality for machine learning one today in the morning, we also discussed structure learning, right? And so this is the final exercise of this notebook, um, which is the, the cause of structure learning. And yeah, without further ado, to also be in, in time with our scheduled appointment, um, I wish you a lot of fun.
And so, welcome back. Let's finally discuss the solution to the last exercise of today's tutorial. It is about causal structure learning. So you remember in causality for machine learning one, in the morning lecture, we talked about fast causal inference as well, and um, about you know these separation and conditional interdependencies and, and how we can make things sure. But I was also mentioning a method which I refer to as NOTIS, NT for short, which is using the cyclicity constraint, right? With um, the uh, the trace of the the matrix exponential, and so these are two kind of families of, of going about on these things. Um, in general, Notius does not make any you know specific statements about causality per se, right? But it's a very popular structure learning method for DAX, right? And since DAX are ubiquitous in, in causality, uh, it's it's well worthwhile uh, showing this method here as well. So first, we simply set it up, and for this, we have the libraries at hand. So so no coding from our side. Um, we just load a data set. So here we have uh, the example data set as we presented in the motivation about phenotypes and genes with a nonlinear relationship. And now we simply run the methods. Uh, and as you can see, this goes quite fast, at least for these uh, rather low dimensional uh, data sets. In this case, it's just three properties, right? Um, and finally, we can visualize the, the learned, right? And in this case, both as adjacency and as a graph. And what you can clearly see is that fast causal inference um, will find this equivalence class. That's why you have these directed edges, uh, while the notice algorithm will give you directed ones. Um, in this case, also a DAC, which is great. Um, and yeah, both identify that somehow there's this relation to the confounder, but not between the gene B and phenotype directly, which is indeed the case, as we remember from that example, that they are just sharing a common cause. That was the ground truth graph. So in this case, Notius actually discovered the ground truth graph, uh, while um, fast causal inference at least found the corresponding equivalence class. And with that, I think we are pretty much perfect in time. So just another set of additional resources, additional to the slides. Anything is anyhow public and available in the GitHub and, and will be shared on the Teams. Uh, you know, there's some other tutorials and, and references to some packages. And also, as I announced during the lectures, there's this discussion group which is going on weekly. So if I anyhow sparked your interest in this area, then please, please just join and, and, and check it out. I think you'll benefit and enjoy a lot. And again, there's also this workshop later this year. So yeah, without further ado in this case, uh, thanks for having me. And I think, um, yeah, we, we spent some great time together, both in the morning and the afternoon. And I think there's only one more lecture left. So uh, I, I hope yeah, you get to enjoy uh, that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mati, I don't know. Uh, don't see any questions, but uh, would somebody like to ask a question? Seems not. Uh, I had the problems with the last part, uh, just last part with causal uh, uh, structure learning. I could not load this simple data set. I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, uh, I don't maybe, maybe it was not loaded before, but it, it is yeah. not. I mean, you can retry. Yeah, again, of course. So don't of worry. Course. <laughs> of course. Uh, now, uh, just a question to this last part. Now, uh, these are simple examples with uh, uh, relatively low uh, number of variables. But now, if you go to uh, what is very uh, popular and unsolved uh, on many uh, levels are biological networks. And there, um, you know, you have, uh, okay, even if you use a lot of biological knowledge, you will easily end with tens, hundreds, and maybe even thousands of variables. Uh, how do, do these, mod, uh, now these uh, algorithms scale uh, like, these two ones that you show uh, with this number of, of, of variables uh, practically. I mean, we have yeah. seen here it's uh, on the on the cube of the dimension of the problem. So exactly, exactly. So so for Notius, right? I mean, it's still polynomial and it's a low polynomial. 
Um, but obviously running it at practice, I mean, you, you do it on your personal laptop and you can already not go beyond 20 notes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in principle, I mean, it's at least polynomial in that sense. So, so that's kind of okay. And people have started improving mm -hmm. it. It's just like, you know, in general doing matrix multiplication and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. For the FCI, it's really just also depends on, on the complexity of your conditional independence tester, right? But in principle, there's no issue, so so we can scale these things. Issues are more on the on the on the representation learning side of things, which we didn't discuss today, but maybe yeah. at some other occasion. Um, yeah. But still, even even here, uh, ideally, we want to we want to scale these up even further. Um, and yeah, I think this is also one of the big challenges, right, where people should start investing because we have seen all of these things make sense and 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 they help us reason about the world in a way that humans do. Uh, it's just that we humans are a lot more sample efficient, uh, and so that's what we. Yes, do. yes, but it's not always causal. Also, <laughs> I mean, true, true. Uh, you, humans you don't reasoning. always think causally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I I I really enjoyed this, and it was uh, really a lot of uh, new information, and uh, really uh, this is the area which. We, prosper certainly now in, in days of uh, explainability and all, and all these AI uh, going to uh, to different applications which uh, should collaborate with humans. And I that's, agree. Uh, that's, uh, that's the important uh, thing. So uh, I, uh, I hope uh, we will be in contact in future and uh, that we will be able to uh, uh, host you in life. Uh, this school was organized in split. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, so uh, it would be much nicer having you there and uh, also that we are all there. But of course, uh, I agree. Still. I think in person, <laughs> yeah, after so long with COVID, I think having something like this in person would be a lot of fun, definitely. And, and thanks for the offer. Yeah. Thank you again, Mate, and uh, I also uh, want to say to our uh, participants that 